Bench. I'm your host Charles and in today's episode we're going to convert a standard PC power supply into a bench top unit that will provide us with regulated 3.3 volt, 5 volt, and 12 volt outputs for use in future projects. To get started you're going to need a power supply from an old PC, a soldering iron, solder, wire strippers, hookup wire, and a bench top power board kit from SparkFun Electronics. You can find links to the products used today in this video's show notes. So let's gather up all of our parts and head over to the workbench. For this project, I'm going to be using a 650 watt power zone modular PC power supply from a company called Be Quiet. I chose the power zone because of its high efficiency rating, modular design, and its sleek black appearance. A huge thanks goes out to Be Quiet for sending us this model for the tutorial. You can use any PC power supply for this tutorial as long as it has a 20 or 24 pin ATX connector and any extra wires can be desoldered from the PSU circuit board or you can leave them attached in case you want to use them for upgrades in the future. I chose a fully modular power supply for this exact reason. A modular PC power supply features an array of different cables that are not permanently attached to the power supply and can be plugged into the PSU as needed. This helps reduce clutter and improves the look of the final product. With the PC power supply out of the way, let's move on to taking a look at the Benchtop Power Board Adapter Kit from SparkFun Electronics. The kit is nothing more than a basic double-sided circuit board, a 24-pin Molex female connector, some fuses, and several binding posts. I paid about $20 for this kit a few months ago, and since then SparkFun has updated it to include a PCB-mounted power supply switch. Now that we have all the parts needed for this project, let's start the build by soldering up the circuit board. Here you will see all the components we'll need to solder to the circuit board. You'll notice that I've already attached the fuses to their little mounting clips. This helps keep them correctly oriented when soldering them on. Their fit does leave a little to be desired though, and I've had to use some blue painters tape to hold them flush to the circuit board and prevent them from falling out when flipping the board over. Now that the fuses are soldered on, let's move on to the 24-pin Molex connector. The connector easily clips onto the circuit board and is firmly held in place by two little plastic clips. I used a scrap piece of tape from the fuses to help level and prevent the circuit board from sliding around. Up close you can see that I'm applying just enough solder to create a nice fillet that slopes down from the connector's pins to the copper pads on the circuit board. I apologize for the missing footage of the lead and resistor being soldered on. I forgot to press the record button after resetting the camera's position. With everything soldered up, we need to cut a few jumper wires to connect the binding posts to the circuit board. I'm using SparkFun 22 gauge hookup wire as it comes in a box with several different colors. 
The jumper wire will need to reach from the circuit board to the binding post, and after a quick measurement it looks like each piece will need to be about one inch and a quarter long. So grab your wire strippers and cut four pieces of red and four pieces of black wire. Now we need to strip the ends of the wires. One side will need to be stripped slightly longer than the other, and I found that about 1 8 of an inch on the long side and 1 16 of an inch on the short side is about right. Once you have the wires stripped, place them one at a time into the circuit board from the back. The black wires go into the small holes where there's no visible trace, while the red wires are placed into the ones with the trace leading back to one of the pins on the Molex connector. Now flip the board over and solder each of the wires from the top. I had to do this one wire at a time because it was quite tricky to keep them from all falling out of the circuit board when flipping it over for soldering. With all of the wires soldered in, it's time to attach the binding post. Place the post in their corresponding holes and secure them to the circuit board using a lock washer followed by a nut. With all of the posts secured to the board, bend the wires we soldered to the circuit board so that the other exposed end is making contact with the metallic end on the correct binding post. The closer the better. Once all of the wires have been bent and are making contact with the top of the binding post, we can begin soldering them together. A good quality soldering iron will make this task a lot easier, and I set the temperature on my SparkFun 937B to about 500 degrees Celsius to help quickly heat up the large metal connector on the binding post. Using the fat end of your soldering iron, heat the binding post and push the solder into the joint between the post and the wire. Keep flowing in the solder until the wire is fully encapsulated and repeat this for the remaining binding post. Now that we are finished with our last solder joint, let's plug the circuit board into the PSU and switch it on. If you're using a modular power supply like I am, you'll have to connect a 24-pin ATX cable to the PSU as well. Also remember to plug the PSU into a mains power source. I forgot to do this and spent 5 minutes troubleshooting before I realized my mistake. With everything connected, reach around to the back of the PSU and flip its power switch to the on position. If everything was soldered correctly, the LED should light up and we can move on to testing.
Use a multimeter to test each of the power outputs on the circuit board. Here you can see that the 3.3 volt rail is outputting 3.35 volts. The 5 volt rail is reading at 5.11 volts. The 12 volt rail is giving us 12.22 volts. And the negative rail is showing negative 11.93 volts. Well, that's it. In less than 10 minutes, we built a benchtop power supply that will provide us with regulated and reliable power for years to come. It's important to note that each power supply is different and each voltage rail on the power supply can only handle a certain amount of amps. So consult the user's manual or the manufacturer's documentation on the website to see exactly how much amperage your power supply is capable of. Thanks for joining me at the workbench today. If you like this episode, thumbs up the video and click the subscribe button to ensure that you don't miss future episodes. Also, leave us a comment below to let us know what you thought about this project.